welcome justice to the African Women in Law Legacy Project. Joining us today is Justice Lillian Tibatimwa Iriki Kubenza. I hope I got that right, Justice. Welcome to our program. It's an honor and privilege to be able to speak with you about your amazing groundbreaking career. So many firsts in Uganda and in East Africa. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, Juan. Justice, you served, and you said I could call you Lillian, so I'll do that, and please call me Anne. You Anne. served You served on the Ugandan Court of Appeals, the Constitutional Court, now the Supreme Court, and your justice in seashells, the Court of Appeals. We're going to talk about all that, but first, I want to hear about where you grew up. I think in the Iganga district, who inspired you as a young girl to get an education? I really think it was my parents. Um, the youngest child among seven, seven of us, my father expected nothing less than excellence from all of us. Uh, my mother was an extremely intelligent woman. My father was an administrator at the district and the county, in the beginning, the county level really, we used to have what they used to call Saza chiefs. You have a county and the administrative uh, head of that county was a Saza chief. That is in the local language, but you call him really, he was a county chair. And my mother was um, a nurse. She actually did training as a nurse and also did some training as a midwife aiming to become a double nurse. But halfway through, she met my father, and so she never really completed the midwifery, but she was a nurse. Now, both my parents were very, very passionate about the education of their children, both boys and girls. And actually, we were taken to the best schools that could be taken, that a parent could take their children to, where we come from in Iganga district. In fact, my, the, the boys did not go to the same district as us because the best school at that time for boys was in another district. So that's where they were taken. But the girls, the best school at that time was in the very district where we were born and that's where we are taken. So we had a very, very strong foundation right from elementary level. And then secondary school, I went to what was then the best school in Uganda for girls. Uh, so it meant moving away from uh, the district where I was born. And I went to another district in Kampala where I had my education. But actually our parents expected nothing less than excellence from us. So I think when it comes to education, they were really, the engine, both dad and mom were the engine uh, to make me what I really later on uh, became. And were you fortunate enough for them to see you become a judge? Were they my, alive or were they late? My father uh, did not even see me as a deputy vice chancellor, but he saw me as a professor as a PhD holder and as a professor, and he was extremely, extremely proud of me. My mom died only a year ago, but unfortunately by that time, she really, uh, what she was suffering from is it, is it Alzheimer, what do you call it? So she did not quite comprehend it when I became a judge. But when I became a deputy vice chancellor, mom was still with us in all ways. And she was extremely, extremely uh, proud of it. Well, you said you had to change districts and it was certainly a long course to ultimately get to your PhD. Mm. And, I, and I assume the road was not easy. So were there things they told you to help you keep going, to keep pushing? to what your goal was? 
Actually, as I said, uh, my, my dad, <laughs> my dad expected nothing but excellence from all his children. One of the things I recall is that um, the sister I followed was an extremely brilliant girl, very brilliant. She didn't have to work very hard to do well. So she was always, even when we we're in uh, elementary school, she used to be fast, fast, fast. You know, every other term she came back with um, grades uh, top on the top in the class. What? Although for me, um, I used to be six, fifth. You know. So I remember one day coming back home with a report when I had, I was the second and I was so excited. And I remember going to my dad and saying, dad, I was the second. And then he asked me, who was the first? <laughs> who was the first? But for me, I think that made me work very, very hard because I wanted approval. And actually in a secondary school, I, um, I, I think it was first in uh, primary school, the last year I was, you know, it's a seven year program. Uh, when I was in uh, primary seven at one time, I was the first. But I remember that question when I'm saying, dad, I'm the second. And then he turns and says, who was the first? <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I think the epic is work hard, work hard. We expect you to be nothing but the best. So any anyone who discouraged you, you had that in the back of your mind, the first mm -hmm. and work hard. And so okay. your career, you mm -hmm. focused on being an academic and, and law. So can I ask you what inspired you or what caused you to consider the, mm -hmm. the study of law? Uh, it, it is actually interesting that um, this question was asked some time back when I was together with the uh, girls I went to school with in primary school. And sort of they gave me an answer. They said that, you know, what we remember about Lily, because that's what they used to call me, that any time somebody was being uh, treated unfairly, I was told that I would stand on top of the bed and start judging who is right and who is, who is not right. And I'll never forget that because I laughed so hard because I used to be a very small person, you know, short, small, but my voice was deep. So I would stand on, um, on, on top of the bed because I went to a boarding school. And then I would start telling people who is right and who is wrong and what must be done. Now, I, so I don't know really whether that was begin, my beginning, the beginning of my journey to, you know, justice. Justice was extremely important to me. But anyway, fast forward, my, my, my sister who I followed, the one who was always fast, did uh, take law at Makere University. And uh, then I also followed. And incidentally, the two of us were the only people who uh, were not scientists because my other, my other siblings actually did science subjects and, and did not get into law. So, so perhaps, uh, perhaps it was sister, perhaps I can't really give an answer. And so your journey in law, like you said, you followed her to McCary. You had a postgraduate diploma in legal practice. You got your yes. master's of law, I think, in Bristol. And you were the first woman to get a PhD in law. Um, and you became uh, an associate and full professor of law in East Africa. You were the first. You were deputy dean and deputy advice chancellor. Uh, so how did that academic, so there was a marriage really between academia and law. Why were you interested in being in academia, higher learning, higher education? I think in terms of academia, when I was at law school, um, it was a, really the practice that the best students would be brought back into the faculty, they would be encouraged to come back and teach. And in my year, I was the second best. So both of us actually 
uh, three of us actually came back to teach law. Um, when I left law school at Makere and I went for the diploma, uh, the diploma in legal practice, it was also in Kampala. It was the only school then anyway for a diploma in legal practice to uh, enable you to become an advocate. I got an invite from the then dean of the school uh, and I was told that Dean wants to see you. So I went back to the school and they actually told me they would want to meet and they would want to have me on their staff. But even then, apart from, I, I, I was privileged that they actually invited me. But by that time, I had it in my mind that I wanted to teach law as opposed to going into um, legal pra practice in the sense of uh, going to court. For one reason or the other, I was almost, uh, almost, uh, I, I don't say, I can't say scared, but I did not feel like becoming an advocate. So I went to teach law because I felt comfortable. I really felt comfortable in that, um, in that space. And, and you said your passion was justice. I mean, even from jumping up and down that bed in the dorm and yeah. judging. So the, the, how did the uh, academic career tie into your passion for justice? What were you able to pass on to your students and how did that affect you as a professor and a leader on your campus? Actually, originally when I started teaching um, law and its principles. I did exactly what the majority of people who had told me did, take on a literal interpretation of the law. I hardly questioned whether the law should be what it was. I just talked about what the law is by reading statutes certainly, and then accompanying uh, precedents or accompanying judgments and case law. But three things happened to me in my career, which totally changed the way I was teaching the law. And the first was uh, the jurisprudence of equality project. Uh, when it was introduced in Uganda, I was uh, one of the two pioneer uh, facilitators on that program. And incidentally, both of us were academicians who started training judges under the jurisprudence of equality program. And then the second experience, and really the jurisprudence of equality program introduced the teaching, the, the training of judges in Uganda in gender and human rights. And the most important objectives of that training were to enable judges or judicial officers to identify bias, discrimination, and stereotyping, and so on and so forth, and how it actually impacts on women in their search for justice. So, and then secondly, my doctoral studies. Uh, my master's degree had been in uh, commercial law, uh, but when I went for my doctoral studies, I changed, and I, uh, and I actually, uh, focused on the experience of women in the criminal justice system, processing women through the criminal justice system. And I use gender as an analysis, uh, a tool of analysis. Then the third one was the women's law program in Zimbabwe. I got onto the women's law program in Zimbabwe at the University of Zimbabwe, there is a center for women's law. Now those three experiences, uh, or those three programs or projects who had one thing in common. They expected the facilitator, the first and the, and the last, and of course for me, even as a student, a PhD student, it was expected of me that I interrogate the law within the context in which it operates. So I started questioning, does the law really lead to justice? 
Although as a young girl, I'm told I wanted justice and you know fairness and so on and so forth. Once I got to law school, the way I was taught the law by the majority perhaps did not help me go back to what should have been Lillian or Lily of those days. But when I got this experience through these three experiences, again, I started asking the question or maybe not even asking the question. I had no choice but to accept that justice and law are not necessarily the same. That law does not necessarily lead into justice for the marginalized and vulnerable. So I even changed, completely changed the way I was teaching the law at Makere. I would teach the students about, this is what the statute says, this is what the courts have interpreted the law to be. But I want you to answer the question, should the law be what it is as we see it now? Then I think for me, the most interesting thing was I then recognized the power of the judicial pen because I came across groundbreaking judgments and I could see judicial activism. And I realized that, wow, if I became a judge, I would actually be able to move law from a literal interpretation of the law from a black letter law and I get into justice. So when I changed the way I was teaching, I recall very well when my students would evaluate my teaching, one of the most common comments was, she is a reformer. Some of them perhaps said it with a lot of anger, I don't know, or some really thought it was a good thing, but I it kept on having, you know, because you do read your, uh, you know, the evaluation forms from your students. She's a reformer with a lot of exclamation marks. So now that's when I said, wow, there is power in the judicial pen. Of course, we can also reform the law through parliament. But when I came across some of the groundbreaking uh, judgments, I knew that perhaps justice calls for judges who interrogate the law and move it forward. And so whenever I got frustrated with a, a statutory provision, even as, even as I was teaching my students or even case law, but especially statute, I would tell myself, hmm, that let's see that, you know, I would tell my, I would remind myself that the executive and the legislature do not have the power to determine whether what they are doing is constitutional. They do not have the authority to determine whether what they are doing is, you know, is in line with hum the human rights uh, concepts and framework and so on. It is only judges who have that power. But as it is, you don't wake up and apply to be a judge. I had to wait for an, an opportune moment. Let me stop you there then, because this, uh, so your academic career turned out to be quite an enlightening and eye-opening experience. So you mm -hmm. learned about the importance of reforming but also the importance of the judicial pen and this phrase you had that law does not equal justice mm -hmm. in all the studies. And you're, it, it, so very interesting to me that that mm -hmm. opened your eyes and you thought about the judicial pen and the power of the pen. So let's talk about that because now we know what moved you from academics to being when a judge. I was struggling in terms of do, do I really want to be um, um, an administrator? Do I really want to go into management? I remember my husband telling me, go for it. If we get it, well and good. If we don't, you'll have become visible.